I never heard them talk about plot, ever. They talked about characters and conflict. Can you explain the three elements of a Hollywood pitch? Well, I'll start. Um, the, the first thing is a hook because, so you have to have a premise. We, we've talked about this many times in the book. Um, so the first way though, the first way in, in my experience and in what we talk about in the book is you have to start with a sentence that hooks people. And uh, um, Peter, will you tell the one that comes from Carol, Carol, Carol's pitch, Carol Hafner's pitch? about uh, the girl who leaves school for a year. I love that. I think it's an excellent example. Um, <clears throat> I can do it. I'm not sure I'll get the wording exactly right. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you learn more if you don't go to school. Right. So it's called leap year or gap year. I'm sorry. It's called gap year. Leap year is a whole Amy Adams movie that I did. So you start with that because that is that may be as far as you'll get if they don't like. So it's one or two sentences at most. It gives you a sense of what the theme or the story might be about. And then if you're lucky, you go to the log line. That's the, which um, I'm sure a lot of people have talked to you about. A but quick, a quick sure, interjection is um, as a... Uh, as a boring psychologist, which I guess is redundant, um, one of the things we look at a lot is the principle of primacy. The thing you hear first is the thing you remember best. And <clears throat> there's hundreds and thousands of studies. I give somebody a list of items to buy at the market. They always remember the first one. It's just what we do. Right. And so the first thing you hear is very important. And so if you can get that very first thing to be something that rattles around in their cortex and stays with them because it's clever and it gives you some sense of where you're going, that's going to help guide them all the way through. Uh, uh, I'll give you another example because we use it all the way through the book, and that's The Odd Couple. Probably the best American comedy written in the latter half of the 20th century, and I would say, and we know this because everybody copies it, um, Hopefully they make it their own when they copy it. Like I was thinking about Mom, which was a great show, but it's the odd couple. So Peter came up with a great, uh, because Neil Simon didn't have to write hooks and log lines because he was famous and successful by the time he wrote the odd couple. But the, the, the hook that Peter came up with, saving your best friend's life could kill you. That's a great hook because it makes you want to hear more. And that's the whole purpose. And it goes with that principle of privacy. I'm going to remember that. That's going to stay in my head. And, and it's an anomaly, which, which makes it a little more powerful. Yeah. And it's a little poetic, too, which is nice. So now tell them the premise of The Odd Couple, which is that, I mean, I'm sorry, the log line, the, the next step. Please, this is... Oh, I, um, <laughs> I don't know if I ever told you this. You can cut this. You know, my dad produced The Odd Couple, so I, I have a personal attachment to the TV show. Which I always thought was the best of all of the versions. Um, where were we? Oh, logline. <laughs> log <line. laughs> uh, getting old as hell. Um, you can cut that. Um, so, so it's the um, the the neatest guy in the world moves in with the sloppiest guy in the world. They have all the same problems they did with their wives. And what, what am I missing from that? There is something missing. No, no that's I think good. that just, is just it. say a divorced couple. Two, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say divorce. The the a two divorced divorce men, the sloppiest guy in the world and the neatest guy in the world, move in together and have all the same problems they had with their wives. That's the that's the log line. I hope you can cut around this. <laughs> Would you say Laverne and Shirley was another yes, version absolutely of the odd a couple? Yes, absolutely. Complete. And because Gary Marshall, who was Penny's brother, had produced the odd couple. So I'm sure that, I mean, the thing is, it's been, you know, when I say it's t used, I, I mean, I think the really best ones, certainly Two and a Half Men is, you know, which is not a show I've ever loved, but. Um, but that's certainly the odd couple. You know, it's two brothers and they couldn't be more disparate, so. 
flip. Or now, on a, we we on told light. you this in a previous interview, but we have a flair for repetition. Um, <laughs> in other words, we forget things. <laughs> <laughs> that when Jeffrey and I were writing our book, Interviewing Comedy Writers, we were saying, do you think these writers are going to go more, because they're creating stuff on the spot, we said, are they going to go more for character, or are they going to go for story first? And we found out that the answer was neither. They went for conflict. All comedy, all any, any kind of entertainment, no conflict, no story. And so the nice thing about the log line is right away you're hit with, here's the major conflict, and you can see, put two people like this together, and they're going to approach every situation from diametrically opposite points of view. So the conflict is constantly inevitable. Right. And, and that you can see it as you're listening, you can already see right. all the ways you're going to have conflict. And, and any, like any good story, it grows. It, you, know, it, it, you know it's going, you think it's going one place, like the Andy story, but you can't see the end, and that's what you want. You really don't want people to know where it's going. The minute they know where it's going, in my experience, and I'm sure Peter has a similar experience, and we've had it together, is the minute they know where it's going, it's an I I think it's an automatic no. Yeah, we heard that. Um, we well, this details is, are really important, right? And I know this is a cliche example, and we've we've been told you know this is overused, but Sunset Boulevard is one of your favorite movies. It is my favorite. Okay, <laughs> okay, right. American okay, so movie. Yeah. Okay, and <laughs> that that if you were to pitch it, you said you would use you would pitch it based on the characters. Always come from the characters and conflict. Um, that's what we learned. Um, so, you know, when I, I think sometimes in film schools, um, I think it's changing. Structure, structure, structure is taught first. And well, maybe it's because of how I grew up and who I grew up around. I never heard them talk about plot ever. They talked about characters and conflict. A couple of the people who we interviewed in that book are no longer with us. They were like, like Sherwood Schwartz. You know, but you brought up the Brady Bunch. Um, I, I don't think uh, he or Leonard uh, Stern talked about, they talked about conflict and they talked about what would the character do and what do they want. And in every scene, I think this doesn't get talked about enough, is um, what do they want, not just in the whole arc of a story, what do they want in each scene? Um, and I, I think, in, and what's in their way? And that's conflict. And and when in the case of Norma Desmond, what what is she doesn't I mean to boil it down. She wants to make a comeback, and I think what's underneath that and what makes it you know and people don't realize that it's a satire, and that, that's why they got so angry in Hollywood when it came out. You know, Louis V. Mayer, Jack Warner threatened. They said you you're trading, and they said to Billy Wilder, you're trading on the industry that has fed you and created you. And, they didn't realize it was a satire, you know, because it's also tragic. But yeah, I mean, she wants she doesn't she doesn't want to be passe. She she's writing that script, which William Holden describes as drac, you know, and she thinks that's going to be her comeback. And I'm happy to say I've never seen the musical because <laughs> um, I didn't want to spoil the experience of the film. <laughs> 